Rocky. The very name conjures images of a realm filled with flying machines. Machines that snore and spark and sail over seas of cloth. But most of all, Lockheed is a world of people. People backed by more than a half century of pioneering tradition. A tradition of being there first. Today, that same vibrant spirit lives on through dedicated people of vision, talent, and imagination. Good morning, Sidney. How are you today? People in industry and manufacturing, and people of science. Still busy. People in education. Conversion. And people in the arts. People who design and build and monitor the most sophisticated of today's technologies. And people still holding to the old ways. People immersed in the research and development of new products and ideas. And people of finance and international commerce. People who are dealing with the world as it is today. And people looking toward tomorrow and the shape of things to come. It's a company that began with a dream, almost as old as man. The dream to fly. Of all, though, it is with the Lockheed California Company that the corporation's roots run the deepest. Comprised of four separate facilities, this is where Lockheed's long tradition of excellence first took hold and became the legacy for those companies that followed. The California Company is held together by a kindred spirit where innovation is a way of life. A constant striving to accomplish what has never been done before. Such was the case in the mid-1950s when the U-2 made its debut. Flown by the United States Air Force, the sleek, long-winged reconnaissance jet has played a paramount role in our nation's defenses from the moment of its first flight. Today, a new, more advanced version, designated the TR-1, is an airborne intelligence center that collects, stores, and can feed back vital tactical information to command posts for immediate use. Yet, despite its military origins, of growing importance over the last few years has been the U-2's use as a tool of science. Carrying the colors of the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, Lockheed's high-flying birds soar over the earth like giant condors. Gathering millions of bits of information with each flight, data which is later meticulously studied by Lockheed and NASA scientists to help us better understand and manage the Earth's precious natural resources. The success of the U-2 paved the way for the most effective reconnaissance aircraft ever built the fabled triple sonic SR-71 Blackbird. Like its predecessor, the SR-71 was conceived and built in the California company's famous skunk work. For the more than 150 pilots who flew it, they called it the Sled, or Habu, after the deadly Okinawan snake. No matter what it's called, the SR-71 is the world's highest flying, fastest air-breathing aircraft ever. It has traversed the world on top-seeker reconnaissance missions at speeds of Mach 3 plus equal to a mile every two seconds. It soars like a rocket through the world's most highly charged and dangerous airspace and can photograph 100,000 square miles of terrain per hour and fly from Los Angeles to Washington, D.C. in 64 minutes. Its range is 3,500 miles without in-flight refueling. And it can create a double-sounding sonic boom called the Sound of Freedom. It's 40% faster and flies higher than the Concorde, which flew seven years after the SR-71's first flight. The SR-71 has lines any intergalactic starship designer would love. It looks like an aeronautical star of a George Lucas movie set. 
It was designed by Kelly Johnson and the Lockheed Skunk Works to fill a serious deficiency in America's reconnaissance gathering capabilities. I think it will be a long, long time before we have an airplane that has higher performance than the SR-71 because the need for it is not there in terms of the fact that we can have satellites circling the Earth in 90 minutes and we do not have to uh, go any faster than what we go with this one right here and it'd be very, very expensive to go Mach 4 or faster. So we may be seeing here the highest speed uh, military airplane that there will be around for a long time. What was needed was a high-flying, fast airplane that could overfly heavily armed and dangerous hostile territory, rather than the protracted loiter times required by the U-2. A product of the A-12 family of aircraft, the SR-71 flew first on December 22, 1964. A year later, the SR-71B, a trainer version, made its first flight. SAC 9th Strategic Reconnaissance Wing at, at Beale Air Force Base, California, accepted the first operational SR-71 on May 10, 1966. A total of 31 aircraft were delivered to the U.S. Air Force over the next four years. The SR-71 is powered by two afterburning Pratt & Whitney J-58 turbojet engines that burn a special JP-7 fuel. It's 107 feet, 4 inches long, 18 feet, 5 inches tall, and its wingspan is 55 feet, 6 inches. Its service ceiling is 92,500 feet, although it's believed to have surpassed 100,000 feet. That's 13 miles high. The SR-71, empty, weighs 67,500 pounds. Fully loaded with fuel, electronic equipment, and cameras, it weighs in at 172,000 pounds. It carries no armament. The fuel, 12,219 U.S. gallons weighing 80,280 pounds, is carried in the non-insulated silicone-sealed fuel tanks in both the fuselage and the wings. Nitrogen is added to the fuel tanks to pressurize them and prevent vapor ignition. On a reconnaissance intelligence mission, it's filled with 45,000 pounds prior to takeoff, and at 35,000 feet where the titanium expands, it's then topped off with another 40,000 to 50,000 pounds of fuel by KC-135 tankers. Top off takes around 12 to 15 minutes. The operational cost per hour is estimated at 39,000 US dollars, not counting the cost of in-flight refueling and ground maintenance and support. The SR-71 is mostly made of titanium, which allowed Lockheed to make the wings and fuselage paper thin. With the addition of radar-absorbing ferrites and plastics added to all of the leading edges, the chines, which are downward sloping, reduce the radar cross-section by 90%. Its radar cross-section is lower than the B-1B bomber, due in a great part to the angle of the chines, flat underbelly, angled composite tails, black paint, plastics, and a special anti-radar coating loaded with iron ferrites. It's a double delta-wing aircraft with two large engines mounted in large nacelles. At mid-span, a large movable spike protrudes from each engine nacelle and controls the velocity and air pressure coming into the engines. The spikes act as throttles, providing 70% of the airplane's thrust. Off-the-shelf electronics didn't work because of the extreme heat, so all the new designs and materials had to be used. The pilot and RSO who sits in the back seat wear the S1031A gold pressure suit, nearly identical to the suits worn by space shuttle crew members. Its F1 stabilized ejection seat is so powerful and accurate it can even propel the occupant to a safe, deployable parachute altitude from a stationary position on the runway. Flight controls use four Avalons, 
located along the trailing edge of the SR-71's delta wings to control both pitch and roll axes. Dual central pivoted all-moving rudders provide the control in the yaw axis. Movement of the control surfaces is achieved by hydraulically powered servos. The SR-71 also has digital automatic flight and inlet control systems, internal navigation systems, and receivers and defense jammers. Its drag parachute is ejected when landing speed reaches 50 miles an hour. In addition to its drag chute, it has anti-skid brakes to slow down its roll. The tires are filled with nitrogen to prevent explosion upon landing. The SR-71 flew its first mission on March 21st, 1968. From Kadena Air Force Base on the island of Okinawa. The mission? Overflight of North Vietnam. At the SR-71's speed, that would only take 8 minutes flat. However, a mission usually lasted five and a half hours, with multiple flyovers and frequent in-flight refuelings. On every mission, two SR-71s are flight-ready in case one has to abort. SR-71s also flew out of RAF Mildenhall in England and were involved in missions over the NATO Wasserpark Theater of Operations, including Egypt, Israel, Yemen, Lebanon, Libya, Iran, and Iraq. Early missions over Russia were designed to detect the Russian order of battle, including photographic, radar, and electronic intelligence. Long-range technical objective cameras, one strip and one framing, are mounted in the Chine base for this purpose, and slar side looking radar and nose-mounted cameras are used. It also has advanced synthetic aperture radar that provides real-time all-weather day or night imagery. During the late 1960s, SOC's 9th Strategic Reconnaissance Wing had two operational squadrons. However, due to budget reductions in the 1970s, the wing was reduced to one operational squadron. Air Force SR-71s have logged more than 53,000 hours of flight time. Almost 12,000 hours at Mach 3 Plus, flown more than 3,500 operational sorties, 25,862 aerial refuelings, and had more than 1,000 surface-to-air missiles fired at them, and all missed their mark. Now let's take a look at a typical mission profile and see how the SR-71 did its job as a champion for peace in our time. Continuous Monday morning music. At 4.30, it's time for headlines on the half hour. The National Security Council and the Defense Department met yesterday to discuss U.S. options in dealing with the newest international crisis, but officials at the Pentagon were not available for comment. Thank you. 
thing was that we were flying from the East Coast to the United States over a lot of water uh, to get to the areas that we were conducting the reconnaissance. Tremendous pressure in terms of knowing that uh, if anything went wrong, um, you could be in headlines tomorrow. So the areas that we wanted to conduct the reconnaissance over, there were a lot of politically sensitive borders that you wanted to avoid. So flying those missions required a lot of concentration. The navigation system provided you all the information you needed in order to be exactly where you wanted to be. But there was a little extra concentration on our part in order to make the take good. Able? Yeah, the sensor take from this morning's SR-71 flight is in the system now. We can transmit any time you're ready. OK, uh, hold one. Lieutenant, takes in-house and being processed. OK. At APS, this is Abel. We're ready to receive. Cindy, I'm going to give you number one. Russ, the target we talked about the other day, that's yours, number two. Bonnie, I'm going to give you number three, okay? Sir, there's a new revetment on image 10. 10? Yes, sir, lower left-hand corner. Okay. Let me call it up. Hey, Don, take a look at this. Cindy says we got a new revetment in number 10. It's like up there. Looks like we might have some. Yeah. Go ahead and get some measurements out. Okay. And up here. A little bit more. There you go. That's good. That looks okay, pretty that good. Looks yeah. good. <laughs> Let's get it in the report. Okay. Transmit it. And major questions were raised as events escalated again today in what is becoming one of the world's principal hotspots. While tensions increased here at the Pentagon, sources expressed concern that continued development could expand that local situation to include the major world powers, and speculation that increased activity could even threaten the scheduled arms limitation talks. As events thousands of miles away became increasingly ominous, behind these walls, the president's top... Okay, what do you got? Yesterday's SR-71 flight picked up something new. Oh? Mm -hmm. This shows up here, as you can see, on the latest imagery. And here's the same area from an earlier flight. It's quite obvious the differences. Yeah. yeah I see what you mean. Now, this is a threat that we can't ignore. We'll have to take a firm stance. But we've got to avoid military action. Now, this type of imagery will be crucial. When's your next Blackbird flight? It should be ready to go about now. Tune to News Radio 98, and in the headlines at this hour, a continuing drama unfolding in one corner of the world has government officials here facing tough decisions. News from the troubled area continues to be sketchy, but reports of a new series of incidents have touched off a debate over what stance this country should take. Amid pressure for U.S. intervention from neighboring nations, there have been. U.S. to step in. Amid this increasing pressure, the debate on Capitol Hill focuses on the summit talks and what impact U.S. action would have on the non-action The local U.S. military command that would allow American forces to extend deployment to counter any potential threat. Pentagon officials say such a proposal would significantly increase the level of U.S. military involvement. Declined to say whether the president has actually ordered military preparations, but one senior official said military commanders in the area have been put on alert. action aimed at the U.S. that constitutes acceptable provocation, either legally or politically, for a military response. Yes, there's been terrorist activity, bombings, hostages, but these are only symptoms. Yes, we're getting pressure from the locals to intervene, and we've certainly got major interests at stake there. But 
We don't really know what's going on. Are there external forces at work? Is it about... As I suspected, the president has ruled out military action. He wants a diplomatic solution, and we have 72 hours to provide the ammunition. Now, where do we stand? Well, that special flight we discussed is on for tonight. Good. The new sensor suite should give us the final imagery we need to complete the picture. Okay. We're running out of time. Yes, sir. Six o'clock and time for the nightly news. On the international crisis front, the situation became increasingly unstable today as three countries broke off diplomatic relations. With the controversy continuing unchecked, fears are that one or both of the superpowers will be drawn in, making it impossible to sit down at the conference table and negotiate. In the latest development, the president will address the morning session of the United Nations General Assembly in New York tomorrow to recommend severe sanctions. Yeah. I've got the flight data. I think you'd better look at this right away. Time for a film. Two minutes. I'm on my way. But first, you should know we've got a situation change that's going to mean going back in with another flight. We're going to have to talk about that. What's this about another flight? We're already cutting it fine. That deadline still holds. 
I know. It'll be a complicated mission, and we'll only have one shot, but it's essential. I think you'll agree when you see these. Here. Take a look at the increased activity. We've got to validate that. And we'll need detailed study of these new targets they've pinpointed. Hmm. Yeah. With what I'm seeing here, there's absolutely no time to waste. How soon can you have another blackbird in the air? We're shooting for 1,300. The planners are going to have a long night ahead of them. What do you got, Frank? Looks like we have tasking for a radar mission that has to be airborne tomorrow by 12, 1300 local. So we're going to have to work probably through the night to get this all done, get all the materials put together. Yeah. All right, here's the first one. Okay, second one is uh, 5410. 5410. Looks like they're pretty much falling in uh, nice tight grouping over here. We won't have too much problem to give to the sensor planners. To, Get the radar on these. Go ahead with the next uh, set of coordinates. Okay, 57, 57, zero, zero. Well, gents, looks like this thing's a gore. Here's the tasking, as advertised. Well, it sure is. If you do the briefing, I'll get the notification checklist running. Okay, thanks. Excuse me there, Sergeant Holden. I need to speak to you in private places, sir. I've just received word of a very important higher headquarters director tasking. I know you've been working hard to put in some long hours, but I need to ask you to put in a lot more hard work. We need to get this aircraft ready to go as soon as possible. Yes, sir. You see any reason why this aircraft cannot meet that tasking? Yes, sir. It's in pretty good shape. Okay, if you run into any problems, make sure you keep me informed and uh, do not discuss this mission with anybody other than those people that have a need to know. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Colonel Smith, crews, staff, I'm Lieutenant Colonel Crook with a pre-takeoff briefing for North 169. This mission is classified secret and the room is secured. The crew is present. The mission is North 169, a radar mission. The mission was executed at 0400 this morning. Takeoff time is 1300 local for 6 hours 15 minutes. Your recall word is dagger. Remaining communications data is as shown in your comm flimsy. Your route for North 169, you'll be taking off. The end refueling, start your climb, accelerate for entry into the sensitive area. Your abort point is 125 miles back set from DP 22. 
Your inner sensitive area is 120 miles back set from DP-22. Steep turns are programmed for DPs 22, 23, 24, and 25. You'll be exiting the sensitive area 110 miles back set from DP-27. 27 is the ARCP for your Arctic II refueling with rows 5-4 and 5-5. comment on these unconfirmed reports, but one analyst viewed the development as a serious threat that would elevate military policy in that quarter to a whole new level. Meanwhile, at the United Nations, members from 46 nations called for collective measures to resolve the controversy. The Secretary General, however, declined to say publicly whether the UN Security Council had accepted or rejected the resolution, which recommended severe sanctions. Okay, we'll be uh, pushing up the tanker at uh, DP-21 and complete the uh, AR checks and we'll start our uh, acceleration immediately after that to uh, Mach 3. Uh, we'll be crossing into the sensitive area right about this point and uh, we'll complete all our checklists uh, prior to that. Uh, flight plan route sensors will be starting to activate uh, approximately here. <clears throat> That's about 100 miles back from the city, right? Exactly. Okay. We went to this uh, left turn. Uh, sensors will be operating at that point, so uh, just be advised about that. And uh, how's the uh, fuel checking out? Looks like if we're 2,000 pounds below the fuel curve here, we're going to have to abort. Okay. In the event we need to do that, let's plan on an immediate left-hand turn and come out uh, straight for the coastline. Okay. And uh, if it's a fuel abort, we'll proceed directly back to our second AR, uh, DP-27. Otherwise, good. we'll just press on uh, as the flight line reindicates. Okay, that's about 200 miles back from 26. Right, that yeah, looks good. Uh, we'll come into the uh, second day R. I'll be working uh, uh, the rendezvous with him, and we'll plan on hooking up here and then uh, going back up to full tanks for our return back home. It's a hot AR. Right. Two tankers, no more. Yeah, two scheduled in there, so we'll uh, split the offload.
I got you loud. Hear me okay, sir? All right, you can go ahead and close up. All right, so I'm going to check your face in here. All right, face is good. I'm going to bring you up on uh, system two. All right, sir, you can go, go ahead and open up. Go ahead and lean back. Okay, sir, we're ready to go. Okay, sir, we're ready to go. Minor good. Yeah, minor good. 
Circuit breaker checked. Get in the front. And get in the rear. As network news continues, a White House spokesman has just announced the latest development in that explosive crisis situation. Citing fears that American interests would be threatened, the State Department today issued an advisory to all U.S. citizens living or doing business in the area, urging them to depart. Meanwhile, Pentagon planners are reported to be meeting at this time to formulate response options calibrated to minimize the risk to the American presence in the area. And air filling checks, air filling switch on. It's on. Okay, I've got the tankers here at 11 o'clock for about 25 miles now. Roger that. Look, 5 4 flight, decent in Excel. John, we're stabilizing. Just look good. Moving into contact position. Roger. Oh, moving in. 20 feet. 10 feet. 5. Contact. Boom. Interval. Roger. Three zeros. Contact. Interval. And four pumps, please. Roger. There are four pumps. Thank you. Need three. Looking good, hold about that 300 knots on turn. Thanks. And uh, we'll be clearing off your right wing after we get our pressure disconnected. Roger, sir, have a good flight. Thank you. Okay, John, pressure disconnect now. After murder's coming. Roger, watch, head out secure, and I'll see you What's our status? They're approaching the area now, but it's touch and go. What do you mean? Trouble? They're running into unpredicted temperature inversions, about 80,000 feet. If the maneuvering gets bad enough, it could cause a fuel abort. We can't afford to lose this chance. We've got a flight crew that can handle it, but they'll be doing more than just enjoying the view. Set. Let's check good. Fuel check. 
Yeah, it looks like we're about 3,000 low in the fuel. Roger that. Okay, this will be a problem. Plan no lower than 2,000 pounds. Let me take a look at the flight plan. I'll be right back with you. Okay. Yeah, uh, we definitely have a problem here, Terry. Uh, if we don't approve our situation, we may be in a board. Okay, I'll start to uh, see what I can do from this end. Let's take another close look at it. Uh, Check approach the sensitive area. You bet. Now, about one minute out of the sensitive area at this time. Uh, checklist is complete. And fuel trend is positive. Still shown as 2,500 pounds low, not enough to go. Roger that. I'm going to have transfer to get our CG to a more efficient load. Roger, monitoring. And turn about 30 seconds to the next turn point. Roger that. Step over the heck. Ready. Ready. Heck. 15 seconds to go. Got it. Uh, fuel is very close. Check it out the decision point. That's it. Roll out. Checks. Stand by for the turn. Ready. Ready. Index. Turn. Back ankle still good. At the decision point, our cockpit is a go. Front cockpit is good. Okay, fuel holding at uh, 2,000 low. That's been acceptable. Okay, that's right on the ragged edge. We cannot accept any fuel degradation. Right. As long as it temps, uh, not that air temperature holds, will be good. Yeah, I think it's going to work. Stand by for sensor activation. The sensor's coming on. All of this will be irrefutable in correlation with the previous imagery. In this next view, we've got the same thing. And here again. And look at this. This is exactly what we need. We couldn't have better ammunition. With this evidence, they'll have to back off. Well, I think our crisis should be history by the weekend papers. And the world will never know what really happened.
In November of 1989, the United States Air Force made an electrifying announcement that it was terminating SR-71 operations. Initially, after more than 24 years of service with Strategic Air Command, it felt that spy satellites could adequately perform the SR-71's mission. The SR-71 program was officially retired at Beale Air Force Base in January 1990. Good evening. Recent budgetary cuts for the Air Force have ended funding for the SR-71 Reconnaissance Aircraft Program. Local civilian and military personnel had the opportunity to view the final functional check flight of the SR-71 as it prepared to return to the United States. Rolling down Kadena's runway for one of the last times, the SR-71, nicknamed the Habu, performed a functional check flight in preparation for its last trip to the United States and into the pages of history. The atmosphere was charged with excitement as the flight crew, Major Jim Greenwood and Captain Steve Zaviniak, were assisted into 45 pounds of pressure suit. The physiological support technicians then conducted pressure tests on each suit and again performed these tests in the aircraft during pre-flight. The extra tests help ensure the suits will work in the event the pilots need to eject. The suits allow ejection at altitudes above 80,000 feet at speeds of Mach 3. After all pre-flight checks were done, the engines were started and the Habu came to life and soared into the skies of Okinawa for one of the last times. From Kadena Air Base, I'm Airman Rob Ivey. Three 71s were turned over to NASA, two SR-71As, and the only remaining SR-71B. NASA needed the planes to continue high-speed, high-altitude aeronautical research programs at its Dryden Flight Research Center in California. Between 1990 and 1995, there were lots of efforts in Congress and parts of the Air Force to restore the SR-71 program. During operations Desert Shield and Desert Storm, there was an immediate need for strategic reconnaissance material, which was not available to General Schwarzkopf's field commanders. Because of intelligence shortcomings during the Gulf War and other global needs, Congress budgeted 100 million U.S. dollars for reactivation of three SR-71 Blackbird reconnaissance aircraft in 1995. As a result of the 100 million U.S. dollar allocation, the Air Force announced that it was reactivating the SR-71 program with two aircraft, and the sharing of the SR-71B with NASA. Ones used by NASA were returned to the Air Force at the time as well. The Air Force stated the SR-71 was a cost-effective stopgap measure, filling a dangerous degradation in America's battlefield intelligence. Apparently, other forms of intelligence gathering systems were not delivering as promised. With NASA's experienced pilots and trained personnel available, the Air Force was able to jumpstart the program. In January 1997, the Air Force announced that two SR-71 aircraft were ready for deployment and would currently operate from Edwards Air Force Base, California. However, funding needed to begin operational missions was not yet available. On April 27, 1998, the U.S. Air Force made a riveting announcement. It said the legendary SR-71 Blackbird, a pioneer in reconnaissance aircraft, will be permanently retired from Air Force operations. Any airframes not required by NASA will either be transferred to Air Force bases for permanent display or sent to the Aerospace Maintenance and Regeneration Center at Davis Monathan Air Force Base in Arizona. The SR-71 is still the only aircraft today that can fly at a sustained flight speed of Mach 3 at extremely high altitudes. Its operating environment makes it an optimal platform for research and testing in many different areas, such as thermal protection materials, aerodynamics, structures, propulsion, high temperature, and high-speed instrumentation, and mapping ground impact size and shape of sonic booms. Information derived from sonic boom research may help to develop supersonic aircraft that produce sonic boom levels that might be acceptable to cities below. In addition, it has helped test communication satellite hardware before being launched in irretrievable satellites. Other sets of NASA SR-71 flights have explored the radiation effects upon crew and passengers for sustained flight above 65,000 feet, 
which is an important consideration for high-speed civil transport. NASA's research has also involved future space vehicles such as the Lockheed X-33 single-stage-to-orbit spacecraft, which uses the linear aerospike rocket engine. As discovered during Operation Desert Fox in December 1998, there was a great need for quick and accurate strategic intelligence to determine mission effectiveness. Little is yet known of other methods used that were effective in this condition with Iraq. If you enjoyed this video, please remember to like and subscribe. And as always, thank you for watching.